Today, we are very fortunate to have a Coalfield employee, Caleb Hanshaw, who official title is crew chief at the uh, Refresh High Wall Mingo. Did I get that right, Caleb? I hope I you did. I heard someone say it better. So I think I should just record that and play it in front of everyone. Um, but yeah, beautiful. It can be part of your outgoing voice. It could be part of your outgoing message in your voicemail. Absolutely. Ringtone, something like that. Yeah, I think it should be. I feel like your ringtone would be like Keith Whitley or something. Oh, I, like uh, the legend, maybe like George Strait. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it, I think it's my wife right now saying, pick up, pick up, pick up. <laughs> Stick with that one. It usually love- works. So, Caleb, give me a little bit of backstory growing up, you know, life then versus life now. Kind of kind of take us on the, uh, the, the quick train ride from Caleb's beginnings to where we are right now. In okay. Your, in your neck of the woods. Okay. Well, um, I luckily grew up in Mingo County. I was born there was raised there and a lot like others my age um, couldn't wait to get out uh, was so focused on what we didn't have that I couldn't wait to go and explore the world and you know thought that I knew everything and ended up moving to Florida for school and became a youth pastor for um, a church down there started my career in ministry which led me to come back home uh, in West Virginia. It's funny, you can't wait to leave, but once you leave, you can't wait to get back. And I found an opportunity to come back. Um, my wife and I married a couple of months before we, we moved back and she fell in love with the place. So she gave the final word. She wanted to raise a family here in Appalachia. So we left, came back, and I was in the ministry for about four more years, Um, then slowly started to transition out to more entrepreneurial stuff, uh, more agricultural stuff, um, which led me to to Coalfield Development. Hopefully that was quick enough. That that was uh, that was really neat, man. Lots. I don't want to say there's a lot to unpack with that because it makes it sound weird, but I am curious ministry here then florida then back to here like talk a little bit about that i mean what were some changes um you know along the way and what was it like adjusting to you know like was it was there a difference in that sure um you know i i grew up in in church um i kind of grew up in that dynamic so um i kind of always had an interest to helping people. Um, so that became a passion just to see people um, get healed uh, mentally, physically, uh, and become whole. Um, and oddly enough, that that dynamic really doesn't change across state lines. It's, it's really the same um, yeah. wherever you live. And it's always based around people. You always find that community that that is your tribe um that relates to you that gets you and we were lucky to find that wherever we went um so i'm super grateful for the churches that i were that i was involved in even even though they were different denominations which is very interesting um they still were our people and just yeah. just ever grateful for that for that time you know, that warms my heart to hear that because, you know, we live in very divisive times. I mean, I see people getting in knockdown, drag out arguments over sports, <laughs> sports, politics, religion, you name it. So the fact that, you know, you can talk about um, ministering helping to heal people with different denominational backgrounds is pretty awesome. Listen, I, I didn't know that a Florida versus Florida state game was that big a deal. <laughs> oh, it's a big yeah. deal. It's and, a very, 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't want to be wearing Seminole stuff in Gainesville. <laughs> and you don't want to be wearing Gators gear in uh, Tallahassee. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I found that out the hard way. But did you quickly figure it out that the weather was a little bit better than here? <laughs> unless, Listen. unless you like this wonky, I don't know, man, like we either, you know, I, I used to believe we have all four seasons, but in October when it's like 32 degrees in the morning, I feel like we've like frog leaped into winter. And then this weekend it's going to be like 78. So I can't figure it out anymore. I don't know, but well, we're, we're learning adaptability, man. Um, I will say in Florida, I like to eat and sometimes pounds come along with that. So when you go to a place where like you walk outside and you can't breathe, you feel like you're getting trained by NASA every day. I couldn't wait to come home. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't sweat so often. So I, I'm going to be a, a, a huge component for West Virginia weather, even though um, you can't really tell what it's doing right now. You can't really tell, but one thing that you can clearly tell is, you know, West Virginia and, and most of Appalachia this time of year looks like a Bob Ross painting. Matter of fact, when I look at the hillsides, I can just hear his voice. Oh, listen, you say you say the things that he says. You you go around a winding road and like, oh, there's a little tree there. There's a little tree there. Bright orange. It the spirit of Bob Ross comes over you on a on an evening drive. So that's completely true. Yeah, it does. It's it's amazing. I just wish I could replicate the hair in some way. That that that's a bucket list item. I I've got to get that hair going at some point. I don't know if like that's a violation, some policy HR. I have to check on that. I don't know if you can have that. Hair. You do it is just rubbing your head against the carpet and just keep doing that like yeah. a couple hours. You should be able to get some inches that way. I, I feel like that would work. You know, that's that's really good advice. That's exactly why I had you on today to help walk me through how to achieve <laughs> next level Bob Ross hair. You're welcome. So thank you for that. All right, uh, I'll see you next. Mingo, <laughs> Mingo County. So yep. you you come back to Mingo County and talk a little bit about Mingo growing up versus Mingo today and the overall, you know, what what's it look like in the southern coal fields of West Virginia like then and now? It from from your perspective. Sure. There's there's really two interesting dynamics. And I've been asked this question a lot recently. Um, what was different between then and now? I just want to hit two different aspects. And one was like the economy. You know, growing up in a one industry area, it, it was really cool. Um, we had a lot of hardworking men, a lot of hardworking grandpas. Everybody's grandpa was a coal miner. So to get to grow up in that atmosphere, to see people that worked hard, you catch that in a lot of ways. You can't really learn it. You got to catch it. You got to rub shoulders with people that work hard um, to instill that in you. So I treasure that. I treasure and uh, give credit to my work ethic, just being in this community of, of hardworking uh, guys that would, you know, put 16 hours and then still make it to the ball game with black all over their faces. Um, there was a lot of pride that we had as a community and, and then going on the other aspect of it now where, where coal is, people say, you know, it's declining. It's, it's starting to pick back up now. Um, but I think the inability to be, uh, diversive in what we do as an economy, uh, really struck home. So a lot of people that you know, didn't want to be a coal miner, which is completely okay. Couldn't find a place here to, to live or couldn't find a place here to grow up and be entrepreneurial. So that that's starting to grow now is we're starting to see people that are creative. Um, and it goes hand in hand with the other aspect, like I was talking about earlier, 
when I grew up here, I couldn't wait to leave because all I could see was the lack of, all I could see was we don't have this and we don't have that. And what really changed my perspective and really changed my life and outlook about living here is I can no longer see this area for what it doesn't have, but I have to see it as a blank slate to create. So that's, that's our heart still living here. That's what my family wants to do in, in building a legacy for our kids to grow up is hoping that people would come here that have that same outlook that we have every opportunity in the world to move to, to Appalachia, to West Virginia and create whatever we want to create. And I think people are just waiting for permission to do so. So if anybody's listening, you have permission, just, just go for it uh, and come to a place that's got wonderful Bob Ross trees that you can look at, but you can be free to be creative. Um, and I think we're primed to do so. We have the element of hard work, of a rich history, and now we're growing in creativity and being able to build. Yeah, I think that's a really awesome assessment of where we are right now. We, you know, the thing about West Virginians and and the Appalachian people in general is we've taken a lot on the chin, but we always find a way to bounce back and uh we don't really have a glass jaw we just find a way to bounce back and so uh yeah i th- i think this is prime opportunity like you were saying come here and expand the economic horizon and you know i'm from wayne county originally so and yeah i mean if you listen to how i talk it's pretty obvious where I'm from. It's not Martinsburg. <laughs> it's not Hancock County. Um, you know, it's, it's Southern West Virginia. It's ap- right in the, right in the heart of Appalachia. And, um, I do think now there is more acceptance than ever before for economic diversification. And that's not being anti anything. That's just saying, Hey, let's, let's put, way more options on the table. Let's not be one dimensional. Let's be multidimensional. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and I think if, if we handle that right, we'll be really successful. Like we can't just say this is dead. Let's move on because you're saying to, to people that have rich history that a lot of people don't know about you know, that are just desiring for their story to be told in such a way that's honoring. You know, yes, we do need to adapt and change and, and have more diversity, but we we don't need to do that at the expense of losing our history and losing yeah. our story. And I think we, we've right. done, I think that's why you've, you've, it's hard to have that conversation where if you bring up, Hey, we can move in this, different industry you have that resistance to where it's anti-coal and it's really not you know it's and because we've we've done it in a way of dishonoring history people will take that conversation in a harsh rate a harsh way like that so it's a good point it's a good point that you brought up i just i would love to be able to steward that with honor you can honor the that you have um and give people options to do what they want to do. Don't say, okay, this is, this is going away. Now you have to do this. Or now you have to work on computers. Or now you have to. I think what's going to make West Virginia shine is just seeing the options. Yeah. Uh, everybody, everybody's used to saying no to everything that they, that's programmed. What happens when you have something to say yes to? that you have options to work or, or go for it or create or build. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And you know, a rising tide lifts all ships. And I think you got to find that balance and you don't want anything to sound punitive. You don't want to sound like your, um, you know, a, agendas are getting in the way of, 
economic progress. And we've seen that a lot. We've seen, uh, you know, we've, we've been in atmospheres where winners and losers are picked, not by our own doing, <laughs> not by economic factors within a free market, we'll just say. And mm-hmm. so you got to be real careful because a lot of people are nervous that there, you know, there could be an atmosphere being set up where winners and losers are picked. And like you said, traditions, histories ignored, and in many cases, current economic livelihood. Because mm-hmm. even, even, even when industries are in decline, that doesn't mean they're gone. That doesn't mean that people are not still making an honest living for their families. Um, so, you know, you, you just have to be careful with that. And, you, and it's, it's got to, you know, you're, you got to reinforce that this is positive growth. You know, what we're doing, what our friends are doing is we are wanting to be that rising tide to lift everyone. And it's not selective. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's encouraging. It's encouraging to others that can go for it. You know, you see a wave coming. Uh, <laughs> I know when I'm at the beach and I'm not a surfer. But if you <laughs> like, you know, I could one day do that. Or I could one day go for it and try. I've always wanted to be a surfer. I don't know why. Um, I'm a big dreamer, man. I am like, I'm one of these guys where I'm like, go big and go home. Go big or go home. And Dude, there- there was this classic movie, Johnny Tsunami. Have you ever watched it? Disney movie. Oh, Dude. I think I've heard of that. Now I have to watch it. Dude, like all night. Tsunami? Me right now. Johnny Tsunami. And he he rode rode the waves, man. He saw the waves and went after it. I didn't mean to interrupt you though. It, I thought I thought you were getting ready to drop some lines from point break. Like Johnny Utah, which is a classic movie. Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Patrick Swayze, talk about great hair. I don't know how to talk about great hair and not have Patrick Swayze in that conversation somewhere. That's true. That's true. Are you are you having some problems with your hairstyle? This is the third hairstyle that you you have. Now I'm in this weird transition where it's almost like this quasi televangelist look. (laughs) I'm I'm getting (laughs) well, I mean, and you know, no offense to the televangelists that might be listening to this. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know, man. I've seen some amazing hair on some of these guys. You know, I like, I like, you know, I, I'm always trying to figure out different styles of hair. I'm trying to always change. And yeah. I don't want to get into that. I don't want to end up turning into like, oh, brother, where art there? Where I have to have like Dapper Dan and not Fop. But yeah, I'm, always looking, I'm always looking for new hair jellies to, <laughs> to try out. You you better do something, man, because you look like any second now you're about to take up an offering. <laughs> and that's that's <laughs> actually that's coming from you, a minister. Uh, see, I'm allowed to say it. It's my people. That's right. Yeah, beard products. What do you use? Because um, I got buddies that have these, you know, these big devil ants beards. Yeah, and I'm I'm amazed at how refined and groomed and just they look better than some hairstyles yeah yeah there we need a calendar for west virginia beards um because we've got some good ones um i would i would go for the month of september just because there's a lot of songs that mention the month of september but i think i would be a shoe in but anyways the routine for Appalachians is we wake up, we go outside, and we rub our hands in dirt, you know, and then we spit on it, and then we just rub it in like that, and we howl, um, and we don't want, we don't, we don't wash it off. And I, I have the pleasure of being on a farm, so I just go, just let the pigs kind of fluff it up a little bit. Yeah, uh, and they say it's good, it's good, and then I, I walk on, and then they, I, I swear, I hear them say, "There goes Mister September." So. Um, just putting that in there. I know, you, I know, Ashley, you can pull some strings, um, and you can create things. So, um, a beard calendar would, would go really well. I like the sounds of that. I really do. I think a beard calendar would be great. 
And I think that would uh, – I, I like that. I do like that a lot. I'll, we'll, we'll collaborate on that. And see. it's a great transition to farming, agriculture work. So how did you get into that? You know, you're, you've come back here. So are you still in the ministry at this point? I know you said it was a few more years of that. What, were, yeah. you, were you into farming at that point, or is that something you've always kind of been in and then it just took off? Or how, Explain a little bit about how that got going. I never had a grid for agriculture at all. Um, just, you know, living in the area that I grew up in, like people having tomatoes growing in their gardens and things like that. I never had a grid or interest. Um, I remember it was kind of the highlight of my career in ministry. Um, being vulnerable, I just felt so bankrupt. I just felt like I was always on the go. Uh, I was putting in way too many hours. Uh, my family was paying the price for that of my absence. Um, and man, I just felt this weird and I don't know what people believe in. I just felt this invitation from God to, uh, to pursue simplicity. And step number one in that journey for me was I had this weird interest to grow things. Like I wanted to have like these pots on our deck and I wanted to produce something that people could eat. And I remember the first time we had, and we continued to, uh, to have people up our house and, you know, have what you would call, I guess, a service. Um, but I remember the first time growing the entire meal. Um, it, it was a salad, but everything came out of that garden and I was hooked. I was hooked on the connection between community um, and the land and what you could produce from it, the abundance you could get. So going through even that agricultural journey, it redefined ministry for me. Like it completely changed the entire game. So yeah, do we, are we still in ministry? Um, like that phrase makes me want to puke in a way, but um, we just love people, you know, like, we get involved in whatever uh, ounce of community that we're supposed to be in, and we just live life together um, and and love our families well. I think that ministry kind of robbed my place as a dad and as a husband. So the thought of of going back to a simpler time um, in the garden with my family it just brought us closer together, and I'm for I could never go back. And that's, that's, you know, that's really a neat story too. And probably there are a lot of subtle components of ministry that you're still doing and maybe you don't even realize it. It's just in a very different, unique way, um, which is allowing for you to be closer to your family. And so I think there's, and, you know, it's funny to talk about what is the old uh, faith of the mustard seed there and uh, growing like you're being, you being inspired to want to grow things. And uh, which, I mean, that's pretty much faith, <laughs> constant yearning to grow. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the original desire I had even as a kid to see people become whole, not just, good enough until you come back next week, but really flourishing in their life that spilled over into landscape that spilled over into how can I regenerate this piece of land? So it started in agriculture, then it moved into regenerative agriculture. How can I steward the land that God has given me and those desires really married each other very, very quickly. And you can do them simultaneously. You can really love people well and see them become whole while seeing the land become whole. Um, so yeah, I, I completely drank the Kool-Aid in regenerative agriculture. Um, and it's something I want to do for the rest of my life. So how did the high wall, like how did that journey 
begin? Well, I uh, was starting to step out into entrepreneurial stuff, and we were wanting to open up a coffee shop in Williamson. We were wanting to do a no-waste market-style comedy club, just something for people to experience. And we wanted to do that. What was it? Uh, 2020. That was the time we wanted to open it up. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Nailed that one. That's a Nailed buzz deal. It. Yeah. So, like, we're we're blasting, media blasting. I had, you know, a couple Facebook Lives with the community. Like, we're ready to go. I had a contract with the comedy club. All this stuff we had you know, a studio coming in to make that their home base to record music. And then 2020 happens, which is so weird. I don't know if you remember, but these masks start coming from everywhere and people start coughing and, and then people don't want to go anywhere. You know what I mean? It was so weird. (laughs) Right. So yeah, (laughs) that kind of bankrupted that idea, um, which was, it turned out to be, to be a good thing. And um, Coalfield, was going to be an investor in that plant and getting to, to meet Brandon and, you know, build a relationship uh, through that. When everything kind of fell through, there was an opportunity for me to, to kind of help out with uh, Coalfield's presence in Mingo County. Um, Coalfield was already, you know, very well known um, in the Huntington area and even in Mingo County. Um, but they had some projects coming up and I got to go on the property that they own, which is high wall. And it just it became immediately present that this was a, um, a wonderful opportunity to create a model, um, for strip blind man, strip mine land, um, and what you can do with it. And I guess the rest is history. We're here about two and a half years later. And uh, the project is just gone above and beyond what I thought it could do this quickly. It is a really cool place in, in, a, in a cool area. Uh, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to be there several times. And just the, I don't know, being up on that mountain is, there's something euphoric about it. I don't know, it's just something in the air and the land is just really cool to be around. And I know, so it started in like baby steps and you say it's crazy how it's grown in in the two and a half years for, for people that are listening to this and maybe have never been and they're like, well, what, what the heck is a high wall? Can you kind of do a, a verbal tour here? Like the, (laughs) some kind of a tour here to like peak some interest. Cause it really is a neat place. Sure. I, what I can do is kind of explain the history of that specific property um the the mines that own that property would harvest the coal by removing the top of a mountain and uh it's a very very skilled uh talent the way that they did this uh but the aftermath of that is they kind of flatten everything out and when you come up to the property, you pretty much see like a rock wall as, as tall as you can see. And where it used to be kind of roadways, different levels. I don't know if you've watched Legends of the Hidden Temple as a kid, but it kind of reminds you of this obstacle course. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, I'd, it's a very, very tall, uh, flat piece of property that's, you know, a lot of exposed rock. Um, fill dirt and a lot of invasive species um, when when left to to begin to heal itself. So this property was, I think, going between fifteen, maybe fifteen years of of no activity when it comes to mining. And when that ecosystem like that's been brought to an imbalance. Um, a lot of room for invasive species happens. So if you walked up there when we first started, you see a lot of weeds, you see a lot of autumn olive trees. Um, and, you know, speaking to an audience that may not know a lot about, you know, the different species, it wasn't a habitat for life. 
It wasn't a place for animals to come and find what they need, for soil to be what it is to grow things for people or for animals. Um, so that's kind of the history of the project. So the heart of what we do is to not just fix the soil, not just fix the landscape, but to bring balance to the entire ecosystem. Um, you know, growing up in ministry and my faith, I, I believe that the design of, of the earth is magnificent in the way things work. So if we can help with that. Um, I've learned that the earth will heal itself if left alone. So all we want to do is really partner with what nature is doing and accelerate it. So here we are, I guess, two and a half years later from using some agricultural methods. We now, going from one species of weed, now we have seven species of grass. From having zero birds, now we have birds and frogs and grasshoppers and bees. And you're starting to see animals return to the property. And what that does, it's saying that the ecosystem is starting to find balance again. And when the ecosystem is balanced, life can happen. So, yeah, a lot of people think, you know, we're just trying to fix the soil to grow food, which we are. But the heart of the project is how can we bring balance to an ecosystem that went through such a harsh imbalance? I'm not saying that in a bad way. It's just it kind of is what it is. Um, how can we partner with what nature is already doing um, to, to create a system of life in sure. abundance? Well, and lots of folks down there really appreciate what you all are doing, you and your team. It is a really remarkable location. Big plans for it. Can you can you talk a little bit about, you know, moving forward, like what's the um the the vision, you know, kind of looking ahead, maybe a year, a couple of years down the road, like what is high wall gonna become? I'm sure the possibilities are I don't want to say endless, but there, there's a lot of opportunities down there. If you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, you know, I put in that we start trading uh, like rodeo clowns up there. It got shot down super fast. Um, so we quickly pivoted. But anyway, I, I wish I would have been in on that because I probably would have put in an application. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that was a little side gig for me. <laughs> um. No, I, there's a there's a really cool opportunity for us to be kind of a model and not in a way where we want to say, like, look what we're doing. This is how you do it for every landscape, because there's thousands of acres of land in, in Mingo County alone that could serve from this model of of bringing back land from from mine land. So we want to do it in a way like look at us is the only way to do it because it's different with every place. But I think like we were talking earlier, we could be a wave and we could be just another um, pillar of what's already happening um, in Appalachia and bringing uh, ecosystems to, to balance. But on a practical level, we have an opportunity to, to really start something um, of bringing people in that want to be a part of the story and we're building cabins right now. You know, our, our biggest market is, is people that like to ride the trails, which is an amazing um, industry that we have. And everybody that comes falls in love with the property, falls in love with the place, falls in love with the people. So we want to continue to build upon that um, and be a resource for people that want to come learn or want to come be a part of our story. Or want to come be inspired. I think the, the whole heart of that particular property of High Wall is to find a place where people can find healing or find education um, as we continue the story of, of regeneration. If that's through, you know, a vacation destination, if that's through wellness, if that's through rehabilitation or ecotourism, um, High Wall has many different options in front of it. And the beautiful part of this project is, is we can kind of take one step at a time and see, see what we're given. So I, I'd say in five years, 
we'll, we'll see a lot more uh, community buy-in, a lot more events, um, pumpkin patches, um, f- uh, farm to table dinners, just a lot of, of events that uh, will we'll draw community buy-in where they can be a part um, and tell this story. And tourism is really big right now. And it's cool to see people wanting to come here, you know, in the heart of Appalachia and experience. Cause it is, it's just more of a laid back being outdoors atmosphere. I mean, people obviously are not coming here for a, a beach coastal experience. You know, they're coming here to be out in the woods on trails, fishing, enjoy, mm-hmm. enjoying, you know, the experience of a cabin or even just a rural Airbnb, you know, those are coming online all the time. And so it's really awesome to see Southern coal fields becoming, you know, like you said, these almost these touristy hotspots. I mean, who would have ever thought that was going to happen just even, you know, five to 10 years ago. So it's absolutely awesome to see that unfold and places like Mingo, Mingo County, you know, Lincoln, Boone, Logan, Val, Wyoming, you know, these right in the heart of that Southern Appalachia coal country it's just really neat to see that taking shape. Yeah. I, I would even say a couple of years ago, there wasn't any Airbnbs yeah. on the area. And just seeing the shift to that, I think just people are tired of being busy. Yeah. And they come to a place where they can relax and breathe. And what's so special about our area is we're not trying to be like Gatlinburg or we're not trying to be this big destination what we have that people enjoy is almost free. A lot of the things are completely free. So there's an opportunity just to really be, be brave in who we are, be brave that this is what we have to offer and it's beautiful. So we don't have to try to be somebody that we're not. And that's, that's such a cool opportunity um, for us that people, you know, even being a, being a ministry in Florida, I would bring people back we would come on trips and come back and they would fall in love with it. They they'd want to stay. So you have people that are coming in um, through, through our tour, tourism industry that fall in love. So I think as someone that's lived here and, and is part of the community, we can be proud of that. And we can see that um, about our home, that it is desirable. Absolutely. And you all are doing awesome work down there. And, you know, like, like you said, it's a lot of natural healing in what's going on down there. I um, wanted to ask you, we always ask guests, you know, I know we've talked about some big changes like then versus now. What about moving forward? What do you want the part of West Virginia, the part of Appalachia that you are at now? What What do you want it to look like? Like what's your... Like what's going to bring a smile to your face and just what, what's going to make you experience that? Oh my gosh. Wow. You know, it's finally happened type of a feeling. And, um, and, you know, not trying to make this sound like some beauty pageant contestant. (laughs) Uh, I know it's a (laughs) painting with the broad brush here, but uh, you know, what's that, what's that moment for you? Like if you had to, verbalize that what does that what does that sound like dude i need, I need a freaking chick-fil-a that's what i that's, so that's do the, I. I live in the capital of suburbia usa no, suburbia west virginia known as putnam county Tays valley we don't even have a chick-fil-a i got to go to the huntington mall or i got to go to charleston for a chick-fil-a you know i i hate that you have to carry that burden uh, <laughs> it's a one, big one. Let me tell you something. Let me. Let me I went to we, McDonald's. I'm just going to tell you right now. I'm a big fan of McDonald's. Uh, I don't even know what my cholesterol numbers are. I don't want to know. But I'm a big fan. Probably lots of clogged arteries. But what made it all better? It was a very nostalgic moment for me. Is buying my three. I have three sons. I bought them all. One to buy myself too. And the Halloween buckets that they brought back from the 80s. Okay. I, I love them. Kids love them. I'm like, man, this, 
I'm trying to explain to them, your old man used to get, like, your grandma and granddad used to get him for your old man when he was, like, your age. And that blows their mind. Are they like, well, how do you charge it? Where does it oh. plug in? <laughs> yeah, right. So many <laughs> people don't even know what a rotary phone is. I mean, they don't know what a pager is. I know that's a whole other discussion. But that yeah. blows my mind. It really absolutely blows my mind. I mean, they see them in movies from the 80s and 90s, and it's just such an alien concept. You know, no people will know the magic of hearing a dial-up sound when you're connecting. Uh, to- <laughs> yeah. The 56, or- whatever. Yeah. And then someone picks the phone up in your house, which interrupts you trying to get on the internet. I love right. that. Yeah. Or your mother screaming at you to get off the internet because she has to make a phone call. No one uh, will ever know the feeling of holding up this little black box and it has a number and it says 911 after it. <laughs> and you're like, oh my God. And then you make a phone call and it's like, hey man, you want to come over tonight? Hey man, what are you doing Friday? It's like, dude, you 911 me for that? Yeah, no, every it's time, Every single time. He's probably one of them fools that never answered their pages. So they had to, you know, <laughs> I was a guy sneaking them at school. Which, yeah. you know, now I'm showing my age here, but like now I was the guy trying to sneak him in and you not Zach, be like stereotyped. You were Zach Morris. That I was, was exactly. I was yeah. Zach Morris of Wayne. Well, let's get serious, Ashley. Let's get serious. Let's get, but we got a few minutes. Let's get serious here. Tell me your, tell me your moment. Um, moment here. I'm a dreamer, so this is an easy one to answer. Um, you know, you can go practical with this answer and seeing all these, you know, businesses and communities and agrarian like atmospheres. Um, I can simplify it to I want to build something that can continually be be built for generations. Like whatever we do has legacy in mind. So in five to ten years, and I love I love the model that um, Chip and Joanna Gaines have. Like I'm a huge Chip and Joanna Gaines fan. To, for them to take an area that was top five worst places to ever be um, to top five best places to visit for vacation is nothing short of a miracle to me. Um, but everything that they're building, they have their kids in mind. You know, creating a place for them to grow up, uh, creating a place for them to be creative. Um I would love to see this place where I'm from, Mingo County, for people to dream and have permission to build things that would create kind of a a pregnant, uh, to get people pregnant with that same vision that they can come here and dream and build. Um, I think this is going to be a hub for entrepreneurs. I think this is going to be a hub for the mom and pop places that, um, can start being creative with, you know, the online market and things like that. Um, but I even see a place for artisanship and for really talented, skilled uh, artisans and workers. Uh, it's their time to shine, man. It really is. Any any fear that we had of, well, this isn't going to work, we need to try. So it, in five years, if we've at least tried, I think I think we'll be successful. That's awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate all you're doing down there, and I know I'm not alone in saying that. And I really appreciate you coming on the podcast to share your story and your experiences. And um, man, just keep doing what you're doing. Always keep moving forward. And look, I'm a dreamer too. I feel like without dreams life gets really boring. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's sad. It's when you lose your wonder, man, it's, you lose your vision, you know, and you just, you're just existing and not living. So yep. it's time to in and, and go for it. That's right. We got to be more than just existing. I think yep. that's, I, th- I think we absolutely have to be more than just that. Caleb, thank you so much, my friend for coming on. Hey, Ashley, it was a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, man. Let's do it again soon.